it's the turn of another very young scholar, almost a, a new entry of the community. And uh, yesterday in this room, we talked about a fundamental book uh, for law and economics, economic analysis of law. Uh, either you love it or you hate it, but you cannot ignore it. And uh, I was discussing at the lunch time with someone talking about a famous phrase, standing on shoulders of giant. Uh, it, says, it has been used by Newton no, for discussing development of physics, but actually was coming from uh, Bertrand de Chartres when he was talking about the father of the church and, and how things develop. Now, it's true in many, in many respects everywhere, even in law and economics, because uh, if we can today advance in our scholarship, it's because thanks to uh, a uh, handful of brave people in, in Europe, uh, we have been introduced to the, the discipline, to the approach. Actually, uh, my idea is that probably law and economics as an European root started from Europe, moved to the US, the seeds at least moved to the Europe, and then it came back. But actually, we had to restructure our viewpoint in order to implement law and economics in the modern scholarship. And there are a few people that have been fundamental for doing it. Uh, they are giants, not just because of the size, because of course, uh, but because uh, the intellectual size, the intellectual scholarship. And uh, one of them, probably the most important one is sitting close to me, is uh, Bernd Schaefer. I don't want to give an overview on his career because uh, I would feel embarrassed because you know he, he did so many things. He's actually, among others, professor at Busiris Law School. But I mean, it's just a small part of the story. Uh, the important part of the story is that since the beginning, since at least 1986, he started to prepare a book for the European Community because we had the economic analysis of law, but we always look at the U.S. And of course, I have nothing about it except that uh, we have different uh, legal system, uh, different legal tradition with uh, very different nuances. And we needed something for uh, as a reference. The importance of the book is not just uh, convey ideas, but also becoming a reference uh, and warrant uh, the fact that uh, a field is uh, established. This book started in 1986 in German was then prepared for the European Community in 2004, and last year was published in the second English edition uh, for the European Community. I have it on my table, and whenever I have a problem with the discipline, I, I cannot do anything but consult it, because it's finally my, my Bible. Now, I'm not talking about religion here, but uh, all the religions have a book. And for this special religion that we are practicing almost every day, this book is becoming very important for the community. So I thought that uh, if we have to talk about Posner, we have to talk about also to, about who gave us the possibility of dealing with Posner and many other uh, issues connected to law and economics. So thank you very much uh, for writing the book and being here. I let you the floor. Thank you very much. Yeah, friend, Amilo, uh, very flattering, I have to say. Dear Professor Garnieri, dear friends and colleagues, uh, I'm honored invited here uh, to speak about civil law, a uh, law in civil law country and economics. But it is also a challenge for me, but uh, because I'm very much aware that uh, legal, the legal discipline as we know it, as we have it in all of Western Latin Europe, was invented and developed here in Italy. And in Italy, it became a scientific discipline. And I want to agree with you that, uh, let's say, if in the year 1950, somebody would have asked me and say, well, there will come a 
development in scholarship by which uh, is national narrowness of law, how it is now, is replaced by a more theoretical approach, then I would have said that in the European tradition uh, that will probably come from Italy, not from the United States. But uh, I will come to that a uh, little later. And uh, But I shall deal with this heritage, with this uh, European heritage civil law in more detail and challenge some views which are widespread, but I think wrong, mainly wrong, not totally wrong and not always wrong, but mainly wrong when uh, even law and economic scholars and especially law and economic scholars outside Europe speak about civil law. So first, I want to summarize some views about, about private law, that is property contracts and torts, civil law countries, and ask how these views influence uh, law and economic research in civil law countries. Unlike common law, civil law countries have national civil codes. Many of those are heavily influenced by the French Code Civil of 1804 and some uh, countries also by the German BGB of 1900. And in my lecture, I want to comment on several propositions which one finds in the literature. Um, these propositions are, first, that the rules of private law are encoded and enacted by a legislative body that many scholars of law and economics to label civil law rules as sticky and inflexible, and that law and economics can analytically analyze the consequences of these norms, but not be part of the legal discipline itself in civil law countries. Normative statements based on welfare economics or other normative principles can only be addressed, if at all, to the legislator and not be part of the discipline of law itself. A second and related view on private law in civil law countries maintains that it follows a top-down approach from the center of the state uh, and is distorted by vested interests and lobby groups, whereas in common law, country uh, uh, courts follow the general interest because courts cannot be captured by interest groups. So this is one widespread view. Second widespread view is that national codifications since the uh, 18th century, which ended the continental European use commune, which was the same in all Latin European countries independent from the polity, hampered the scientific character of the discipline in favor of a kind of national area study uh, and or national social study or national geography of law. And third, a widespread view among law scholars is that more economic, the more economic approach to law is an external concept that is being economic, normative economic concepts alien to law, which has no place in the study of legal norms. I shall deal with these three aspects in more detail. Um, that civil code leads to stickiness and inflexibility is a potential but not necessary property of codification. This view is supported by the writings of Montesquieu, 18th century, who called for a clear division of labor between the jurisdiction and the legislature. And this would, however, make the judiciary not one of the three state powers, but powerless. In the words of Montesquieu himself, I quote, dans de tel régime, en effet, la puissance de juger est en quelque façon nulle. In 
such a state, the power of judging is in a way zero. This view that the law is written in black letters and black letters are final <coughs> was a rationalistic idea of the 18th century. Invented in France, it became especially popular in Prussia, uh, East Germany, which was the first European state to enact a comprehensive code in civil 1794, the Prussian state law, 10 years before the code civil. The Prussian king had the conviction that this code would solve all legal conflicts for all times. Under the influence of the king, the general state law for the Prussian states of, 19, of 1794 became a model of precision and rationalistic perfectionism. The Prussian king, Frederick II, who initiated it and controlled its drafting, uh, had the obsession of abolishing, now in his own words, abolishing all the sub subtlety stuff and make lawyers superfluous and thereby resolving all, flick, all conflicts with a big machine in his service. This perfectionism law with 19,000 articles in comparison to 2,300 uh, of the Code Civil and I think if I count it correctly 2,600 of the Codices in Italy uh, articles uh, was an, in so far a caricature and the result of an idée fix. No wonder that this law never get really off the ground. It promoted, however, a popular view, popular views on the law in civil law countries. The more successful codification uh, uh, codifications. Uh, uh, did not abolish legal reasoning and the role of judges, which was enshrined in a century-old legal tradition, which all Latin European countries have in common, and which shapes legal thinking in Western Europe up to date. That Western Europe had long been an, a zone of strife, feuds, and wars may easily obfuscate that it is also a part of the world with a long-standing common legal tradition. Capitalizing on Roman law and its reception in vast areas uh, of Europe, um, a use commune emerged as a Western European legal order that existed independent from the polity. Scholastic lawyers and credit laid down its foundation during the 12th and 13th century, along with groundbreaking legal innovations, which uh, Harald Berman has called a legal revolution, and Jim Godley has called a big bang. The individual will and autonomy came more and more into the focus of law, and the classical Roman numerous clauses of contract laws was abolished and replaced with a general freedom of contract stemming from private autonomy. Scholastic scholars developed a science of law for the content of private law, mercantile law, urban law, manorial law, and feudal law, and involving and, and developed a systematic and consistent legal order, a legal order, with rules of interpretation, with rules of hierarchization of legal norms, solving conflicts of law, proposing overall legal principles and the use of analogy uh, and especially teleological reasoning and preserving internal consistency of the legal order. This gave law a new flexibility and innovativeness. Uh, order replaced the pre-existing thicket of customer. My colleague Reinhard Zimmermann from Hamburg, who is also director of the Max Planck Institute there, put it in these words, I cite uh, Zimmermann, a characteristic feature of this tradition is the pursuit of rationality 
a scientific character of law, intellectual coherence and system, while ensuring, ensuring organic capacity for development. Universities that enjoyed a high degree of autonomy from political rulers and from the church became hubs of especially legal education. Josef Schumpeter, in his work on the history of economic analysis, highlights this and says that here a non-clerical intellectual class with university degrees crowded out traditional clerical elites. Judges increasingly were legal experts trained in universities. The discipline of learned law became international within Latin Europe. And this had a long-lasting positive impact on the economic development in Western Europe. I give you only <coughs> one example how on how powerful this legal tradition was in promoting the economy, which has been highlighted by Josef Schumpeter in the same book and also by Elaine, Elaine Tan, uh, on the medieval bent on interest taking for credits, which was interest taking was, according to the doctrine, usury. Legal scholars and judges in canon courts, usury was called canon court because it was a sin, it was not a crime but a sin, in the 13th century made this ban an empty shell for commercial credits. It was gradually removed throughout Europe, first in ecclesiastical canon courts and later in all courts. And it was based on, a, uh, on an argument which is an, an example, an early example of law and economics. Lawyers had argued that the sale of a commodity on supplier credit at an increased price was a circumvention of the prohibition of interest. The difference between the contractual price and the spot market price must be considered as interest and therefore as usury. The scholastic scholars, however, argued that the increased price for giving a credit was legitimate. The price difference was no usury because the creditor loses something on the way for instance, the possibility to participate in a trade fair as long as the price was not paid. Thus, the price markup could be claimed as a kind of liquidated damages in the sense of losses. And they gave this a general concept, a general term, damnum emergence. And they say that on the way, by not getting an interest, one has a uh, one has a, a loss, and thus they rejected flatly the Benham interest for commercial credits. And this gave uh, commercial credits with interest the full backing of the legal system throughout Europe, and it did not take long uh, that first in Italy, but later in all other countries, the great big financial institutions and banks came into existence. Now, if you, um, Schumpeter, who, by the way, writes about his writings, Sammlung Emergens and uh, the Ben on Interest, he writes that the legal scholars of the 13th century came as close to a general theory of interest as, the, he said, between them and the 19th century, when the theory of interest was fully developed, Nothing of any relevance has been written. Now, if one compares this with uh, a similar development in uh, Muslim states, in uh, Muslim states where they have also a ban on interest, they did not arrive on this level of sophisticated, flatly rejected on te teleological grounds. A uh, ban on interest, which they said it is not usual, and therefore it is legitimate. In the Muslim countries, there was just a um, kind of 
circumvention. So you could become a silent partner and uh, you get a profit, but the profit is uh, fixed uh, and you get the profit regardless whether the company makes, uh, makes uh, losses or profits and so on. So it's a crude uh, circumvention uh, which also worked there, but it, you could never be sure, you know, contractual partners could not be sure whether this would really work in the courts. And as a consequence, the, this circumvention never got the same backing by the legal system in Muslim countries as it did in Western European countries. And as a consequence of this, no uh, financial institutions and no banks from, the, from that time, 12th, 13th century, up to the 19th century, had ever uh, did not develop until the 19th century. The scholarly and scientific perception of law in the 12th and 13th century did not vanish with the national codifications. This heritage regards law as a legal order with consistency and based on principles, independent courts. In this European tradition, they regard acts and treaties not as black letter, but as living instruments. And I proceed to show how important Supreme Court decisions are for the development of law in countries which belong to the legal family of civil law. When the Code Civil was drafted in France, uh, France was an agricultural country. Consequently, tort law was undeveloped. Shying horses were the more, one of the most important accidents at the time, uh, and also the cases were not very complex, they were simple, and the authors of the, and it was undeveloped, and they became more yeah. complex only with the Industrial Revolution and the related accidents. The authors of the code paid tribute to this by devoting only five sections to the tort law. They did not pretend to have the knowledge to structure in detail an undeveloped field of law. Article 1383, which was never changed since 1804, is the one general uh, and comprehensive general clause on tort law, which became style defining for the civil codes of dozens of uh, other countries. It reads in an official translation, every act of man that causes damage to another obliges him by whose fault it occurred to repair it. On this small textual basis, French courts had to answer a host of subtle legal questions by way of interpretation. The question of how to deal with future damages, with pure economic losses, with normative damages, with widespread damages, with causational problems, and with how, how to uh, calculate a damage. All these questions were open, and courts erected a whole system of tort law on this small textual basis. For law and economic scholars, the decision of the French Cour de Cassation on the shipwreck of La Mauricière is well known, uh, in which the uh, French court uh, develop the causational rule of um, uh, perte d'une chance, which is, uh, as Schiebel, Stephen Schiebel says, is one of several causational rules, but the only one which is in line with giving the right incentives to avoid negligence. <coughs> in more general terms, one can say that civil law countries, that in civil law countries, courts play an outstanding role uh, in contouring the law uh, when the black letter remains vague or silent. This is, however, not the only and not even the most important role of courts. As a young professor, 
I remember I had a discussion with a law colleague who wrote uh, something on legal method, and he maintained that black letter law must always be observed if by courts, if its language is precise and leaves no room for interpretation. This is, of course, contradictory to a scientific approach for maintaining a legal order, uh, as I give you an example from German law. Take a speed limit of 30 km per hour in a residential area. This is a crystal clear legal rule. And it is based on a decree which does not contain any exceptions. Several courts of appeal and the Supreme Court ruled, however, on a large number of exceptions. A physician rushing to uh, an emergency can break this, the speed limit, without violating the law. The same holds for somebody driving a woman in labor to a hospital for giving birth to a baby or speeding uh, uh, to warn a truck driver that his load is about to come loose. There are easy cases of overriding black letter law. One can argue that these exceptions are implied terms of the legal norm. The norm setter knows that exceptions must exist, but he has not the information to list them. Therefore, the norm of a speed limit contains an implicit delegation of, uh, of the norm, which allows the judiciary to introduce exceptions. Without such intervention into black letter law, a legal order would over time degenerate into an inconsistent and chaotic thicket of rules. All Western European civil law countries develop such judicial routines to neglect black letter law to preserve the legal order. But it is not a pervading feature, as the following example uh, shows. Russia imported the civil law system in the 19th century. However, in Tsarist Russia, the legal technique of complementary contract interpretation, which is similar to this, what I just told you, which exists, for instance, in France, in Italy, and in Germany, and even in England under the concept of implied term of a contract, was not integrated into the civil law in Russia thereby giving Russian courts more limited judicial leeway. The Tsarist Russian Reform Commission explicitly rejected introduction of this technique. Can a court legitimately reject black letter law if it is either explicit or clear from circumstances that the legislator wants to decide the matter without interference from court? Yes, and if we have such cases, they are generally regarded as um, landmark decisions. I give you again a case from uh, the law of my own country. There was the owner of a well, uh, you know, of, uh, a brewery, and he was a passionate military rider. And he jumped with his horse over a hedge, and somebody took a photograph of him and sold it to a company which. Uh, advertised that this photo, its product, and the, uh, the, the, the product were aphrodisiacs. <laughs> and he, of course, he, he, you know, he saw this, and then he uh, went to court. And now here, we have, the problem is this: that violated his privacy, and his privacy is protected by the sharpest instrument that is a, a injunction. So he can prevent it. But the injunction does not work because he sees it only after it is published. So the injunction leads to nothing. So the second best is now to impose a damage compensation. But as some of you might know, in Germany, damage compensation is restricted to financial damage. Non-financial damages are excluded from damage. <laughs> there are exceptions, but unlike in the example with the speed, uh, the, the, you know, speed limit, these exceptions are clearly listed in the code itself. 
for instance, damage compensation for pain and suffering for physical damage, but not for psychic damage. There are some other uh, rape also um, actions against sexual self-determination in any rape. That also leads to damage. But the uh, lawmaker has made it clear that this is a closed list. So when the court now granted him a damage compensation, that was refuted. It was a contra legum decision. And of course, the defendant here moved the case to the constitutional court uh, on the ground that it violates the Constitution. Article 20 of the German Grundgesetz, the basic law, says that the, that the judges must follow the law. And here they had, did not follow the law. But the Constitutional Court ruled and said that this would leave the person has a right, private privacy right, totally unprotected. And that this is not acceptable. Therefore, sign keeping the legal order as a legal order and not simply as a chaotic uh, collection of sect, uh, the, it endorsed the decision of the Supreme Court. Um, we thus learn that legitimate judicial rejection of black letter law can even include contra legem jurisdiction if otherwise the consistency of the legal order and the violation of its central legal principles are badly affected. Such routines have again their roots in the old tradition which all Western countries, regardless of their polities, have in common since the 12th and 13th century and which aims to uphold the legal order by defending its consistency and teleological effectiveness. That is what legal historians have called, the, we have a word for that, Verwissenschaftlichung. The direct translation is scientification. I don't know whether it has uh, this translation. Sometimes huge legal changes occur in civil law countries simply because the Supreme Court replaces one interpretation of the law by another which it regards as the better law. And here is an example from, um, uh, from uh, Italian law. In Germany, but also in the United States, uh, pure economic losses, which are losses of somebody who has a damage, but his legal position is not protected by an erga omnes property right, that is by property or life or health, something like that, but just here's just the dog. The damage that is a pure economic loss, it's, such pure economic losses are not compensated. Now there is a good reason for this. Very often when we have pure economic losses, there is a tort visa who causes uno actu, damages and losses, and, and gains to different groups of people and they cancel each other out and therefore one can say that it's uh, not a socially relevant loss and therefore it's not compensated. But it is also clear that the German rule which excludes this out with this formulation uh, that it has, uh, that it must have, uh, it must be protected by property, that this is over-inclusive and often uh, uh, destroys, uh, uh, for instance, in an oil spill, uh, if uh, it destroys fishes, um, they are not comp the fishermen are not compensated. They have no legal claim. Now, in Italy, the uh, Article 2043 of the Codice Civile contains a general clause very similar to that in France, but uh, the Italian courts followed fully the German doctrine uh, with a uh, 
to be element of unlawful. There is an un they said there are certain damage acts which are not unlawful. And they then imported the German uh, doctrinal view that if it is not a, a damage to property, it is not unlawful. So they had the same uh, uh, interpretation. But in the 1960s, uh, the distinction between pure economic loss and loss from the impairment of a property right under the concept of unlawfulness, in Italian, un danno in giusto, uh, in the 1970s, it changed the doctrinal interpretation and case law, and with it, Italian tort law drastically which today differs considerably from German tort law and grants compensation in such cases. <coughs> um, a spectacular Italian case was an airplane crash in which several football stars from the Turin, from Turin lost their lives, uh, which caused huge losses to their football clubs. Unlike in Germany, the club received damage compensation for these losses. This fundamental change happened without even changing one word of the Italian civil court. Hernando de Soto deplored in his book, The Mystery of Capital, that most developing countries find no routines to pledge movables like cattle, cars, or machines for better access to credits, and calls these movables consequently dead capital. Some years ago, I read a paper which compared the pledging of movables in Tennessee in the USA and Paraguay, both states with many ranchers. In Tennessee, it is a valid contract, a credit contract, if the bank and the rancher agree that, uh, uh, that all cattle on a precisely described plot of land can be seized and sold by the bank if the debtor fails to service the debt. In Paraguay, this was impossible. Every piece of cattle had to be entered on a list with name or brand number of the cattle. And the list had to be continuously updated if it did not correspond to the individual pieces of cattle. Then the creditor had no access and could not seize and sell the cattle. It was so complicated that cattle was indeed a debt capital for ranchers. Statistics show that in many Latin American countries, mobile property cannot mobilize credits. <laughs> this result, however, results not from a specific stickiness of civil law, but uh, from a stickiness of Supreme Courts in particular countries which shy away from improving the existing law and adapt it to economic necessities. Uh, in Germany, for instance, after World War II, there was a need for bank credit to build up the economy because we are a bank-based country with a weak capital market, so equity capital could not be mobilized to rebuild uh, uh, the German economy. And then the courts and uh, Barristers, lawyers, yeah. made contracts which later the courts accepted in, under which it was possible practically to pledge away all movables, everything, you know, even the money in the, uh, 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 even the money in the cash, the cash money is pledged away. And so if you visit a German uh, firm, you can be sure that everything you see a move which is movable is pledged away. And that is pure... Uh, Dutch-made law. Um, also, uh, German courts had already fully developed the judicial control of standard contracts before Parliament enacted a law which did little more than uh, transfer established case law into legal form and black letter law, and before the European Union issued directives. The equivalent applies to the introduction of producers' liability for defective uh, goods, which German courts introduced long before national parliament and the EU acted. All in all, one can summarize 
that judge-made law plays an important role in civil law countries. <clears throat> this is achieved by interpretation of the legal text if they are vague and undeveloped, by doctrinal concepts which guarantee consistency if an act is obviously incomplete, or by even flatly rejecting black letter law when inactivity of the legislator leads to intolerable encroachment of fin fundamental legal uh, principles, and accepting even new forms of property proposed by the bu business community if this is economically necessary. The widespread view that civil law is a sticky top-down system and common law a bottom-up system is a myth spread mainly around in the United States, even though two of the most illuminating <coughs> books on the uh, 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 books uh, on the 12th century legal uh, revolution in Europe were written by American scholars, Berman from Harvard and Gordy from New Orleans. This finding has consequences on empirical legal studies on the effect of civil law. If such studies rely exclusively on black letter law without taking important Supreme Court decisions into account, they can easily fail. Here is one example. La Porta, Lopez de Silanes, Schleifer, and Vishni have empirically shown that the so-called widely held corporation, that is the public limited companies with free float, are the predominant form of enterprise only in the USA and in the UK. On the European continent, companies controlled by, are controlled by family or other companies such as bank or the state and blockholders predominate. This often cited and highly influential study also contains the key finding that in common law countries, the right of portfolio investors are generally better protected than in civil law countries. This is a mistake. The proposition of these authors have not survived scrutiny. Um, um, uh, I just refer to an, uh, a paper by Sparman, who's now at uh, Harvard University, but he's or originally a, a German law scholar, and studied in Germany uh, with a very good knowledge of German law. And uh, he's a law scholar and a statistician. He found that the indicators for anti-director's rights in stock corporation law compiled by La Porta <coughs> et al were based on incomplete coverage of the relevant legal norms and not included judge-made anti-director's rights. If these indicators were identified and coded more precisely and completely, there is no indication that investors are better, portfolio investors are better protected in a common law countries than in civil law countries. Empirical studies on the economic consequences of civil law rules which leave aside judge-made law, run the risk of overlooking important development and of creating a bias. Also, it is worthwhile to analyze landmark decisions of civil courts in the same way as this is done by law and economic scholars in the USA. And it is worthwhile to compare different judge-made solution, solutions in different countries. Now I come to the point have the national codifications of civil law destroyed the scientific, scientific character of civil law in Western Europe? These codifications strengthen the safety and power of national law, but as already Rudolf von Jering argued in the 19th century, this was achieved by reducing legal scholarship to, as he named it, an unscientific Rechtskunde, a kind of legal area study. However, a legal science with the aim to preserve the legal order by keeping it consistent and to promote generally accepted legal policy principles must, by definition of a scientific approach, transcend national borders and be international. My colleagues, Hein Kötz and Reinhard Zimmermann in Hamburg, deplore the loss of internationality of the legal discipline in many 
of their writings. Until the national codifications, the curriculum for the study of law in all European schools of law was the same and consisted in the instruction of Roman and canon law and also in the overarching teaching of the overarching principles. Law professors, mainly from Italy, changed their positions freely throughout Europe, including England and nowhere were they aliens. Judges learned local laws and custom on the job. On the contrary, the codifications focused legal teaching and writing on the national level at the expense of te te teaching over arching and foundational problems. The general problem of law, problems of law, were central during the times of the use commune and became peripheral for legal teaching later on. And what was peripheral before became central later on. <coughs> the discipline of comparative civil law was an attempt to counteract and provide lawyers with a more comprehensive view uh, how, in comparative perspective, legal orders solved similar social and economic problems and coped with the problem of maintaining legal order, consistency, and following the teleology of law. For law and economic scholars, therefore, comparative lawyers are the most obvious counterpart. Many of those display a well-informed understanding of the, of the necessity to open legal scholarship to economics and uh, 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 to, to economics and other social sciences, as this is a way to uh, maintain the teleological perspective on a, on a contemporary scientific level. In his paper on doctrinal private law and economics, Gerhard Wagner from Humboldt University, who is one of the most knowledgeable legal scholars using law and economics, points to the current problems of law and economics in the EU and in member states. Since more than 15 years, the European Union, the European Court of Justice, favors a more economic approach over purely doctrinal reasoning in member states. The Court of Justice has consistently emphasized that member state law must punish the violation of European standards of conduct with sanction that now, I quote, have a genuine deterrence effect that are now, again, a citation that are effective, proportionate, and deterrent. The European Court argues that this can be achieved in particular by granting claims for damages under private law. With regard to European competition law, uh, in the uh, Courage case, the ECJ recognized <coughs> the behavior controlling effect of private action for damages and emphasized that they could, now follows a citation, that they could significantly contribute to the maintenance of effective competition in the community. The EU Directive on Antitrust Damages, which is now implemented, specified that this principle implies for the design of liability, compensation, and civil procedure. European law, therefore, expressly recognizes the incentive effect of private law rules. The ECJ recognizes explicitly that the interpretation of the applicable law also includes the evaluation of the consequences on the behavior of the legal subjects, together with competing doc doctrinal solutions. One can safely say that uh, at the level of the European Court of Justice, the law and economics approach is now well established. This is still different <coughs> at the level of member states. I have only some, can give you only some examples from my country, what people, lawyers, doctrinal lawyers, say about 
the more economic approach in the EU. Uh, so, I give you some examples. We lapse into archaic thinking, Old Testament style, a screwed up construct, a system shattering, a vehicle of sanctions. The critique comes not only from lawyers, but also even from economists from the so-called Freiburg School who reject any direct <coughs> economic arguments in the courtroom or in general. But the attitude within Germany is also changing. In monographs, legal scholars increasingly defend an economic approach which directly tries to achieve efficiency by using legal norms as instruments. Um, a string of very influential legal literature which exists in civil law countries are commentaries on statutory laws. These are handbooks for judges and lawyers which inform how courts interpret the legal norms about what is the ruling opinion and which alternative opinions exist in the interpretation of a specific norm. Specific norm. The Beck Commentary uh, online data bank informs, I just checked it, that presently these commentaries include more than 1,000 citations on uh, German, you know, on economic analysis, economic analysis in German language. Uh, related to the interpretation of rules. These arguments also reach the level of the Supreme Court. For instance, the Bundesgerichtshof, the German BG, uh, BGH, uh, ruled in a economic, that ruled 2015 mm -hmm. that uh, the German cartel authority can use economic theories for price abuse control thus advocating a more economic approach. This is quite encouraging for law and economics uh, scholars. I cannot give you similar examples from other countries, unfortunately, and I have to come gradually to uh, an end. Um, The methods which we need for a scientific um, approach to law to avoid that it becomes a chaotic collection of rules without any inconsistence, these, method, uh, these methods necessarily include logic, systemic thinking, uh, and uh, the evaluation of uh, impact assessment, the impact assessment. By definition, a thus described legal science <clears throat> cannot be a local and national, but must be a global and international science. Consequently, legal education of so-called learned lawyers was for centuries the same everywhere in Europe. It was possible even in, in the whole Western Europe, with many different states in the Holy Roman Empire, we had at times 1,800 independent states, even independent free villages who had only the emperor as their superior, who had at times not, not much more power than today the United Nations Secretary General. And still we had the same, uh, we had this use commune. Uh, these laws, these different local laws, were superseded and infiltrated by the use commune. <clears throat> the national codification uh, in the 18th century uh, ended this. Unfortunately, courses on the basics are less frequent than necessary. In Germany, such courses are usually not even uh, compulsory. As far as my knowledge goes, this is different in Italy. The national construction of legal education and legal scholarship strains our great tradition. Even prominent law scholars sometimes comment 
on important empirical or theoretical or conceptual research by economists and social scientists as if they were <coughs> tourists. I am not criticizing that law students learn practical routines which have value in their own country. I'm also not uh, advocating a return to the use commune which would imply to turn the wheel of history backwards. And I'm especially not advocating a pan-European code civil which disregards national, regional, and local custom and preferences. <clears throat> and even though I'm convinced that a knowledge uh, which has value only locally and nowhere else is not part of a, you know, of a scientific uh, uh, scholarship. I'm also not criticizing <coughs> that these practical routines are taught in law schools to train students better for the job. But this teaching should not overgrow or even reject the teaching of what is jurisprudence today, characterized by the globalizations of terms, of questions, of answers, by global basic concepts and by interdisciplinarity. Otherwise, if that does not change, I fear that the discipline of scientific jurisprudence, which stands so much in the European tradition, it will not disappear, but it might emigrate out of law schools. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, you've been exposed to a very rich dissertation. And it's always difficult to me to figure out all the topics you are providing. I need several days in order to focus on things. But now we have time for questions anyway. So, um, all the questions from the floor will be welcome. Is there anyone? Okay. I take advantage of my position here for raising the first question. The first question is that uh, if I see something very different fr from the civil law system today and the common law system, is the consciousness of the concept of efficiency. Um, in the month of October, a brave group of us was teaching law and economics to Italian judges. And actually, we discovered that many of the judges were applying efficiency concept in decisions, but they don't want to nominate them as such. They don't want to let them to surface because uh, uh, probably in, in the mindset, in the legal mindset, uh, using efficiency is limiting the perception of justice. That should be a broader concept. Whatever it is, then it's a different story. But why in the, perhaps in the narrow mindset of, of the common law, uh, not in the sense of, of course, of judgment. Uh, efficiency is important because they are paying since the beginning to this balance of things, and cost benefit is one of the very robust concepts for, for. So I'm wondering whether there is someone in the different scholarship affecting the, the outcome. I say, practically, I see very close one to the other, but in theory, whenever one tries to enter the, the, the the civil law system, it seems that, you know, economics is not noble enough for being used as a benchmark. And this is might be one of the difficulties for breaking up not, not only the, the, say, the legal thinking, but even the law schools. Because the economics, you know, is just a side discipline that can be used as a side uh, tool, but is not important enough for legitimating legal thinking. Yeah, I agree uh, with what you said. Um, the, um, uh, when I talk about my own country, then you can say that lawyers, law, even law professors, and even outstanding law professors sometimes, they think more in system rather than in consequences. So they have very little knowledge and very little expertise of thinking in consequences. And if they think in consequences, it is often just, you know, their, their intuition, their personal intuition. And when they are confronted with science, with economics, or even other social sciences, they don't understand it. For instance, 
efficiency has nothing to do or is not the same as effectiveness. But they use it as effectiveness, which is not the same thing. But when they, uh, they use the word, for instance, uh, of, for contracts, that it is an instrument for realizing win-win conditions. So a win-win condition is another name for Pareto improvement, right? So that is a win-win condition that is, can be uh, used uh, in legal discourse, but Pareto improvement, which is much more <coughs> Pareto improvement, means nobody should be worse off. Also, part, other parts who are not part of the contract should nobody can be worse off. But that is not, uh, they, they don't understand this and they don't take, as I said, we talk about concepts, about scientific concepts like tourists. And that, but that is changing. And I'm not uh, so pessimistic that this will not change. Uh, we have now, uh, among the younger scholars, we have many who are open to these kind of thinking and use it openly. Uh, the, uh, I think that the, there is some, even among open-minded scholar, law scholars, they have the, they believe that uh, law and economics is somehow market fundamental, which is also not the case, but you know, that is also some critique uh, and that is uh, different. But um, I think that is changing. It has changed a lot. Now, when I started my career, I was the uh, I was attic in a much more, uh, let's say, pronounced and uh, sharp way as today. Uh, that is uh, that has changed a lot. Are there questions from the floor? Um, given this uh, discussion that you are with Giovanni about uh, the, the growing acceptance of uh, efficiency from the point of view of a legal scholar, I would, I would uh, um, report uh, a discussion that we have in, in a session before and uh, to hear your opinion. So maybe a reason for the so slow, uh, um, so slow acceptance of uh, economic methods by legal scholars is that uh, we are not uh, 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 we, we 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 stop uh, uh, too early in presenting the economic method. And so maybe uh, economics tell us more than. Optimality, and so in, in doing this, we can show that there is also room for concepts that are mostly perceived by legal scores. For example, that justice should not just uh, enhance efficiency, but justice should enhance justice. For example, so which is uh, something that has to do with the uh, notions of uh, different notion of justice. Uh, in, in the law that may, for example, involve distributive justice or other notion of justice. Um, so the discussion we had before is that uh, uh, if uh, um, a typical uh, requirement of the law it, is its uh, effectiveness, the most important concept that is related to this is not efficiency, but it is equilibrium. Nash equilibrium. A Nash equilibrium is an effective norm because it induces compliance by itself, self, self sustainability. And so, in order to affect uh, equilibrium selection, which is a typical problem in game theory, we need some uh, framing that uh, pushes the process toward an equilibrium uh, state. And typically, this may be not just efficiency as a requirement, as a criterion, but some notion of fairness, which typically affect distribution. So th I think that as an economist, maybe a strange economist, because it may be uh, 
philosopher back at the end and a professor of economics. Um, we have more in our tools for making room for notions that are important from the point of view of the legal scholar than just uh, replying to analyze norms, legal norms in terms of efficiency. For example, we can analyze norm in terms of the property of affecting the process of emergence of equilibria, which are institutions in some property included, of course, efficiency, but maybe not enough efficiency because by just requiring efficiency, I'm not able to select any among the wide set of possible equilibria of a repeated game that represent the way in which in society emerge institutions. So maybe we are uh, stopping uh, too early in the book. Uh, we just uh, teach uh, one that the lawyer uh, know the uh, traditional micro textbook. And so maybe we in this way are not exploiting all the possibility that the economic method give us, give us to involve in research and debate also the more traditional uh, legal scholar. What do you think about this trend? Yeah, well, you know, when I hear the word justice, I have some e uneasy feeling because that can be everything. And I think that uh, the economic analysis of law is one has a virtue that it makes very explicit what they mean when they propose a concept. And I think that when we talk, for instance, about contract law, about contract law, a contract law is actually a method of realizing in wind constellation. And if that does not have external effect on third parties, that is the same as Pareto input. And I cannot think of any other uh, ethical maximum for a contract, for a contract between two or more people, then allowing a, uh, a joint surplus. And if we give this up, then we actually destroy, we might able, be able to destroy this virtue of a contract. It goes too far. But I agree with you, and therefore I'm not a friend of Stephen Shevel's view that, you know, that uh, redistribution should always be by uh, redistributing tax income, you know, tax, taxing the rich and giving that to the poor, because he argues that if we do that, we have a double inefficiency effect. Redistribution of income is, comes always with an economic loss, uh, but if this redistribution is, for instance, achieved in tort law, then you have the same economic loss and you have an additional loss by uh, more accidents, for instance, at least by an ineffective, inefficiently high number of accidents. And that comes on top. And that is the reason uh, why many people reject this and say uh, fair distribution of income that is in a modern state should be done by the state by redistributing income, but not by tort law or uh, so that is, but I, I heard some of your paper there. I was, um, I find that interesting. I have some question there, but I fully agree that we have to use a more wider approach. But uh, that does not solve the problem that many lawyers simply are not interesting. They do not take the time to understand even the most simple economic. Uh, um, theorems and concepts. It's a problem, but that is not an unsolvable problem. But I agree, it is not the only problem. And what you indicate, uh, I have sympathy with. Other questions? I yeah. would like to listen. Oh, okay, excellent. Maybe we need to change what we are selling.
uh, problem with what we are selling. Maybe they have good reasons not to buy, and maybe we, that is what we should be reflecting upon. Well, uh, no, I think I gave you an example from the early development of our legal tradition that was a very sophisticated teleological argument with the band of interest objectives. Objected, not, not by a tricky way, but it was objected that led to the rise of the finance industry. That is the way of thinking of economics. But uh, the, uh, this tradition, this way has they eroded and law has become, study of law has become less scientific as it comes more. That is a problem. Uh, it is, uh, I don't think that what we are uh, selling uh, is not good enough because there are hundreds of people who embrace this and who, uh, 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 but it is uh, uh, it perhaps you know, what I also criticize is that uh, in some of the economic research, the um, actually empirical research uh, shows that uh, Economists sometimes come up with research results they do not fully understand the law. Those results are not bought. So that, that civil law countries are bad for economic development. But no, I, I no, no <coughs> lawyer knowledgeable uh, with different uh, with comparative law laws. So in so far you are, but that is uh, the, every science has its shortcomings and they must be. But that is that this is in principle something that bad product, let's say, mm -hmm. that I, I don't think. So I think we have to stop because uh, it's getting quite narrow. So thank you very much for this presentation. We are moving to the next sessions, always in, in the other building. Thank you.